Uh, and uh, before I start, I wanted to clarify something that just uh, came to me. Uh, Rob picked this title for the talk, um, which I realize now might have missed a lot of few people. So this is uh, not about dependency injection, but rather uh, about, well, I mean, the title kind of suggests something like that. It makes a lot of sense to me that you said that. Um, this, this is more about handling dependencies to external libraries that Drupal is now increasingly using and that you might be using for modules or some project that you're working on. Um, and more specifically, this is really just managing these dependencies with Composer. Um, so there are probably other ways of doing that, but I'm specifically going to talk about a tool called Composer, um, how that tool works, which is a, uh, a tool for uh, all kinds of PHP projects, not specific to Drupal. And then uh, later on, I do want to take the conversation part quite literally uh, and talk about how to use Composer better in Drupal, uh, what kinds of things one could do with uh, Composer in Drupal in the future that isn't quite possible yet. Um, and maybe also about uh, what I think is wrong with how Compose is currently used in Drupal. But we'll get to that part later. Um, I'll just start with the introduction so that we're all on the same page and what Composer is, what you can do with it. Um, to explain the background bit, um, I'm not actually a Drupal developer at all. Uh, I, I installed Drupal uh, in the previous session. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to rely on all of you to uh, on your, on your input on the whole using Composer in Drupal bit. Uh, I do work on PHPB, as my t-shirt kind of gives away, um, and uh, work on various other open source projects. Uh, just, I, I really enjoy working in uh, these kinds of open communities, uh, which is why this conference is great, just uh, getting to know another open source community and seeing what these people uh, have to say about certain things, how they interact with each other, uh, and just seeing another one of these communities is always really exciting. Um, and uh, right, that's also how I got into Composer. So about a year ago, a bit more than a year now, um, we decided to uh, move to Symfony with PHPVB, similar to what Drupal's been doing. Um, and uh, we wanted to come up with some new uh, properly designed mechanism for installing plugins for this software. Um, and we started talking to some of the Symfony people, and they had come up with this bundle concept, and they also needed a way to handle dependencies between bundles, libraries that they want to use in bundles. And we realized that this is really the same problem. And there's no point to uh, finding another specific solution just for Symfony or for PHPB, but that we should really try and address this problem in a generic way that will help all PHP projects. And that can be used for various um, tools and projects out there. All right, so that was how Composer got started. Um, and you might think that there's already something like this in PHP. Uh, I'm curious, who here has used pair? All right, that's a lot of people. Who here used pair to install PHP unit? That's so quite a bit. Who's used pair to do something else? All right, that's, that's actually a surprising result. Typically when I do this, about 95% of the room use pair to install PHP unit and they've never used it for anything else. Here it's a larger group, which suggests that people here are uh, building bigger projects, maybe uh, trying more of these tools. Um, but basically the experience that I hear from most people who've used Pear is that it's really tricky to set up. I actually look at a documentation for um, Drush uh, while compiling uh, the, the command line tool for Drupal. Um, and it actually, first it starts with the line that you have to execute to install it with Pear. Uh, and then come about 10 other lines to force install some package that you can try if it doesn't work and then maybe you can overwrite this other package or you can try all depths and maybe that'll work. And uh, So that already suggested to me that there's something wrong with this and it's just a bit too complicated, uh, more complicated than it should be at least. Um, so that, that's the other rationale for behind building a new tool to handle dependencies rather than uh, using the one that already exists. Um, Composer's made up of a couple of different pieces uh, or the, the Composer ecosystem. Composer itself is the command line tool that you use to install dependencies for your project. Um, the focus, as I said, is on being easy to use, not having all these little flags that you have to use to install it properly. Um, and a key difference to something like Pear is that we always install dependencies on a project level, so like within the directory that you're in. So more in the natural way that PHP developers like to work, where they maybe have a set of directories with a different project in each, um, rather than the way that Pear typically is used even though it can be used in this way as well, uh, where you install some system-wide library that is then available across all co PHP code on your machine. 
Um, it's also designed to be embeddable, so uh, it's really just a very thin CLI wrapper around a library, which can also be used to build, for example, a web UI to do the same thing, which again comes back to our PHPB background because we want to use this to let end users install plugins. So we don't need a command line tool to install uh, dependencies, but we need this to be accessible from a web user interface. Uh, and a few things we pay attention to is encouraging best practices, PSRs, um, uh, for example, the uh, naming standard for classes and auto-loading uh, that I'm hoping most of you have heard of, of at this point. Um, SPDX, uh, which is a standard uh, naming scheme for licenses so that you can automatically filter by certain licenses and make sure that you don't install uh, some dependency that actually has a license that is incompatible with what you're doing. Um, and uh, semantic versioning. <coughs> Uh, which is just a standard, or a, a standard description of how uh, you should version releases so that the numbers actually represent uh, in a commonly understandable format what kind of or what level of change is taking place between these versions. And there's Packagist. So we've, we've had this tool that you install dependencies with. Packagist is the central repository that all these packages are available on that you can install them from. Um, Composer is not centralized, so there are alternatives to this, but it's like the one big thing where anybody can just push with whatever PHP code they have onto uh, for whichever framework they like. Um, and it has a great search so that you can just find things that might do what you're looking to do. Um, and it's extremely easy to use again. Um, so typically you just enter the URL to your version control system and it automatically picks up versions from the tags that you used in your version control system. Um, all the metadata is just read from the version control system. So when you do a release, you don't actually have to do anything on the site. All you do is you tag your release in your version control system, which you would do anyway, and that's really all there is to it. Uh, There's a little screenshot from that website where you can see the kind of metadata. Uh, Twig, which is going to be used in Drupal 8 as well, I think. I think that's certain at this point, right? You hope still? Okay, I wasn't sure how far that was. All right, anyway, so you might be familiar with Twig. Um, and you see like the different versions listed with its dependencies. In this case, it's just a PHP version that's the only dependency and some metadata, uh, as well as some information about how often it was installed. Uh, and at the top, you see the search box where you can just type things in that you might be looking for. Um, then I said uh, it's not necessarily centralized. This is just a very simple way to get to open source projects. If you, for example, um, have code that you don't want to publish to the entire world, but rather have some internal set of libraries that you use within your company uh, or something that you just want to have local. There's uh, another one of these repositories, which is a lot simpler to use, just a command line tool um, that dumps this kind of metadata, which can then be used by Composer. Um, so for example, you can run this in some machine in your local or internal company network uh, behind some VPN proxy, uh, whatever you kind of want to set this up like. Um, it really just generates a single file that you can uh, use to load uh, the metadata for other dependencies. Um, there's a bit newer one, uh, which is called Composer Installers, which is actually when, uh, a package that you can install with Composer, uh, which makes it easy um, to then install uh, package, packages in the uh, way that is required by a particular framework. Uh, so the standard way that Composer installs things is just into unpacks them into some directory, but typically frameworks have some other directory structure that they follow um, well, Drupal itself does. Um, so uh, this is a very simple way to just define certain mappings for which uh, files need to go into which directory inside of these frameworks. And there's actually already one available for Drupal there. And I'm going to show how that works later. Um, first, I'm going to like, just run through how do you actually use Composer. Um, I've used the example of setting up a new Symfony project here. Because um, th this is actually their standard recommended way of installing Symfony at this point. Um, so it's, it's a good example for how one's supposed to be doing this. Um, I start here in this case by taking their Git repository um, and then installing Composer. Uh, Composer is actually just a single FAR file. Who, have you heard of FAR files? All of you know what, right? So um, the problem with FAR files is that, that the FAR extension in PHP has a lot of really weird issues. And a lot of the time when you try to run a FAR file, uh, you, it'll just die on you without any kind of error message or output some random crap and you don't know what that actually means or it won't provide you with an error message. Um, which is why we then ended up writing this installer script. And all this installer script is, 
uh, does is check a bunch of PHP configuration settings uh, and then download the file for you. Uh, so you can instead just download the file yourself as well if you're certain that you can execute FAR files. Um, but that's why we recommend installing it just with this little snippet on the command line. But again, if, if that's not something you can do, then you can just download the FAR file yourself. All right. Um, and then all you do is you run PHP Composer for install. And that's the, the, really the only thing you do to install all of the dependencies. And it just goes and uh, looks through the metadata of this package that, uh, that you, or the project that you have, which was the Symfony uh, standard edition, and installs all the dependencies, like the templating engine, Symfony itself, the, the, the entire framework, um, some extensions for Twig, and all the dependencies of the dependencies, et cetera. Uh, and there's a little note at the end, which is kind of interesting. I'll get back to that. It says something about generating autoload files, um, because Composer also makes it a lot easier to then use this code without having to think about where it installed this and where all the code is located. Um, I mentioned this. Typically, it's put into the vendor directory. So this is the result after running Composer install. Um, you have like Monolog is some logging library that Symfony installs by default. You have Symfony itself, um, Twig, the Twig extension that you saw. And there's autoload PHP, which contains this um, autoloading mechanism that you can just include and use right away. Uh, and within Composer, there's a bunch of metadata like uh, the, the list of the installed packages and which versions then were installed and a few things like that. Um, there's an alternative to the setup that I just showed. Um, with a package that's set up like this, you can actually run a command called create project. And what this does is exactly what I described earlier. It takes a copy of this project. Um, it then runs composer install within this project. So it installs all the dependencies for this project. Um, so you can imagine doing something like PHP composer for uh, create project, uh, Drupal, um, Drupal project, or something like that. Um, and you would just instantly have an, the entire Drupal installation with all dependencies installed without Drupal itself having to contain all of these in the downloadable, downloadable distribution. Um, all right, so we've seen how, how you use this, but the question is where does the metadata come from and what format is it presented? Or do you define these dependencies? And um, we use a JSON file that is typically located in the root directory of the project, um, in which you have a require key with which you define the packages that, you, uh, that, that your project requires to be installed in order to operate. Um, the first part is the name. Uh, we follow um, the standard of having a vendor prefix and then uh, the package name itself uh, to make sure that names are sufficiently unique. Um, and the second part is some kind of version constraint. So you can require some particular version, like 2.1 dev in this case. Uh, you can require anything larger than 1.0 dev, or uh, you can require any one point uh, version, uh, as you see with a Twig example, uh, which will install 1.5, 1.6, depending whatever is the newest currently, but won't install a version 2, because that will probably have API changes that break the, your code, and that you would have to first make changes in order to be compatible with. And the second part, required dev, is kind of a nice tool for development where you can additionally specify packages that you just need during development. For example, to run tests, some kind of utilities that you just need during development, but that you don't want to actually uh, have you on your deployed system in the end. Um, and a neat thing here in the note uh, below, you can specify preferred source when installing. And rather than downloading some tar zip zip file, whatever, uh, and unpacking this, it'll actually do a git clone SVN checkout CVS or whatever you're using, um, so that you can actually go into this vendor directory, make changes, and commit them right there and then. There's kind of a problem. If you've worked with Pair and you have the system-wide installation, you can't easily just, you know, if you've got a problem with some package in Pair and you want to make a small change to it, maybe a bug fix, you can't just go edit this, commit it there, but uh, you will have to, well, first debug this, make the change, then kind of take this diff, send it to them, hope that they'll apply it, install a newer version. Uh, it's kind of a long loop. And this makes it really easy to, during development, to just commit this kind of change, uh, maybe even to your local fork of this package, and to then later update to the official uh, fixed version. Um, if you want to publish a package, you need to add a bit more metadata, like the, the name of this package. Um, it's, it's exactly the same Composer JSON file that you use in your project if you want to publish this as a package. Um, you can add a couple of keywords, uh, which are used for the search uh, on packages, for example. Uh, I mean, the, the rest is really self-explanatory. And the last bit is a bit interesting. This is how you define auto-loading, in this case with the PSR0 standard. Uh, you can also find a class map, um, and it will automatically generate um, the necessary auto-loading code. 
All right, there's this far you can install uh, Composer packages, you can define them, you can publish them. Uh, there are a few neat things to Composer um, that it does differently from other systems that um, help you uh, avoid chaos uh, of th this kind of version chaos that starts to exist if you want to work on a project with many people or if you want to distribute a package to a lot of people. Uh, because something you quite frequently uh, encounter is that uh, someone on your team install or builds a package with particular version uh, of, a, of a dependency, uh, and then you distribute this to a coworker, maybe a week later, coworker installs the same thing, uh, and he also installs the correct pair package, let's say, um, and it doesn't work for him. And after a couple hours of debugging, you realize that he did install the correct pair package, however, it was a, there was a minor bug fix release within this week, and that actually broke compatibility with the code that you originally wrote. Um, so just this small delay already resulted in broken code and having a really hard time finding out why it broke. Um, so instead, Composer has a Composer lock file. So when you're in Composer install, uh, with something like the one point asterisk, uh, which will just install any one point version, um, it'll record which version it actually picked. So for example, in this case, it could record that it installed version 1.0.0. Um, and then you typically commit this file into your repository and share it with your coworkers or with users of your product. Um, and when they run Composer install, it'll install exactly 1.0.0, even if 1.0.1 was released within the time frame from you sharing this code and them installing it. Um, and you then explicitly run Composer update to update this log file. And this just makes sure that um, all your, again, all your coworkers always have exactly the same version. If you distribute a product, everyone using the product has exactly the versions that you tested your product with. And if you have a large set of machines, you also make sure that each of them has exactly the same version. Um, because that as well might be a problem if you have something like 10 web servers and I don't know, you add a new one and that one suddenly has a different version of some library, uh, that will cause a lot of problems. All right, um, this is some details on the auto loading that I mentioned already. Um, you can also have a class map where you just specify some directory of files that will just look for classes inside it if you're not following PSR0 yet. Um, and for especially older code, um, like pair code, you might need a include path. It's not recommended because adding a lot of these uh, makes including files a lot slower because it'll have to check each of these directories every single time it wants to load any kind of file. Uh, but it is there if you still need it. Um, that's the file it generates that I mentioned. And all you do is you require this file, you can immediately start using all the classes defined in all of the dependencies that you have. Um, so you, no lo like you never again need to think about where is the code coming from that I want to use here. Um, it's just all directly and available to you to use in your application. All right. Um, I mentioned that we have different ways of defining repositories. Uh, this is how you do this in your Composer JSON. You basically specify the type like Composer, which is the same type that Packages itself uses. Um, or you can directly uh, load packages from a VCS repository, or for example, a Git repository, uh, without actually setting up anything like status or Packages. Uh, you can disable Packages itself as well if you want to, for example, only use Packages from your um, reviewed package list uh, on your internal network and don't want to use any of the open source code. Uh, and there's a neat trick here as well. There's also a repository type called package, which allows you um, to define a complete package in line. So that um, if you want to include some code that you just have a zip file for, which doesn't contain a composer JSON, or maybe this is some, I don't know, something like jQuery that they really, they won't care about composer because it's some PHP dependency management thing. Um, then this allows you to define a dependency on this other project um, without them supporting composer. So you just provide all the metadata that Composer needs within the repository definition. Um, and this is a, essentially, this is a Composer JSON within the Composer JSON, so you can also define things like further dependencies of this package. And then in the end, again, you require the package that you just defined. All right, okay, that's basically what I wanted to explain, how Composer works. I think you all have a good idea of, or an intuition of how to use Composer, uh, what you can do with it. Um, I wanted to say a few things about the state of Composer. As I mentioned in the beginning, it's only a year old. Uh, we've had a huge amount of contributions, though. Um, if, if, this is actually a bit outdated, I think, this screenshot, but there are a couple hundred contributors in GitHub at this point, I think. Um, it's a, so we've gotten a lot of feedback, a lot of help with this. 
uh, which has allowed the project to grow this quickly and to be actually very usable already after such a short time frame. Uh, Packagest already has over 2,700 PHP packages. So that's a really large amount of libraries. And whatever kind of problem you come up with, there's most likely already a package there that solves exactly this problem. Um, so the next time you're working on something and you think you've got some new problem that you need to write some new code for, maybe first check there. There isn't already a library which does exactly that for you. Um, we've just released an Alpha 5 version. So again, it's still pretty young. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't matter that much that it's still an alpha release public, uh, officially because it's a tool that you use during development. So it's not something that could crash your site during, which is running or deployed. Um, it's, it's solely used during development or um, basically the, the, the code doesn't run once the site is deployed. Um, there are a bunch of frameworks and libraries that have started to officially support Composer, which has helped adoption of spreading this. Uh, like I mentioned, Symfony does Zen Framework 2, um, uses this as the recommended standard way of installing any Zen Framework uh, 2 project. Um, there are a lot of other ones that I don't remember just now. I don't know, libraries, like even the Facebook PHP SDK is using this. Uh, or, like, it, it's got a lot of adoption in a really quick time. Um, and there's also some support by platform as a service providers. I think uh, Pagoda Box of just one. They actually automatically run Composer for you when you deploy something on there. Some of these PHP hosting services do this automatically now. Um, and I've seen the first few attempts at using Composer as a library uh, to install plugins in an application, which is what we originally started with, uh, to install the plugins in PHP. Right. Um, there are a few things we still want to do uh, which are preventing us from having a bet at this point. We do want to improve uh, support for web assets, so like JavaScript files, image files, a bit, because at the moment they all end up in the same vendor directory. Uh, but typically, you have some other directory where you keep all of these, or uh, some if you want to separate your web accessible directory from the directory that all your dependencies are in. This is maybe not something that happens in Drupal all that often. Uh, but uh, it's the same thing with PHPB, so we don't have this problem either. Uh, but it's something that we want to work on so that you can actually keep collect all of these files from all the different dependencies that you have and keep them in a single directory. Um, there are just various cleanup things to do, small missing features. Uh, but that's why we're, why we're grateful that we have so many contributors now, because they've helped us identify all of these strange bugs that we ourselves would have come across with certain proxy configurations and all these kinds of things that you have to consider in the, with a tool like this. Um, so we're hoping to release beta in September, and we're definitely hoping for some more help. <laughs> Uh, so go to GitHub where all of, uh, all of our code is hosted if you want to help us out. All right, so that's Composer. Um, let's talk about how Composer is already being used in Drupal, can be used in Drupal, and might be used in the future. Um, first off, in uh, Drupal 8, which is now using, well, we're potentially using Twig, for example, uh, which is now using some Symfony components, uh, Composer is used to install these. Um, there's a Composer JSON file, which unlike what I explained earlier, is located in, a, in the core directory rather than uh, at the top level of the repository. Um, and these dependencies after installation are committed into the repository. So for any regular developer, this doesn't make a difference because they don't have to run Composer install to get these dependencies because they're already in the repository and you can just start working on this. Um, so it's certainly an upside that uh, people contributing to some other part of Drupal don't have to even think about this. Uh, I'll come to what I think is not that great about it later, but for now that's kind of how to play. Um, the other thing that uh, already works um, is a, um, co a composer module for Drush. Is it Drush or Drush? Drush, I guess, right? Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, which uh, basically is just a wrapper on composer for uh, Drush, uh, which has a few uh, nice features. Uh, for example, if you use Drush to install some module, um, that module can actually contain a composer JSON file for dependencies, which will then automatically be installed when you run uh, Drush GL. So in this example, uh, we ha there's a module called Less. Uh, Less is this uh, uh, to, uh, language for uh, CSS, well, defining CSS in a slightly nicer way, which you can then compile into CSS. Um, and there's a library called Lefo Less PHP, which is the implementation of Less in PHP. Um, and the Bless module simply uses this library uh, to provide this functionality as a Drupal module. Um, to make this a bit nicer, there's another uh, module, the Drupal Composer Autoload module, uh, 
uh, which basically makes sure that these generated autoload files within each module uh, then get loaded when you're running Drupal so that, again, like I explained earlier, you don't have to bother with loading the code from the right directories or, or having to uh, instantiate the autoloading for each module yourself when you need it. All right, um, so we'll get into the discussion after this. So basically what I'm trying to say is um, you should, rather than uh, always writing code yourself, uh, maybe you're using libraries, but uh, you're at least always uh, building a set of modules for your project um, that might contain some functionality in these modules, which is really something that could be shared with other PHP projects which aren't necessarily Drupal projects. Um, so this kind of sharing across projects becomes a lot easier if you separate your code into these kind of uh, single purpose small libraries uh, which you can easily publish on something like packages and then you can find these from other people as well as make them available to others and get help from people even outside of the Drupal community because these small and reusable libraries which you then wrap in modules for example um, are just as useful to people who are not using Drupal but PHP. All right, these are adventure links uh, if you want to learn more about this. Um, there's also help in a Google group if you just have questions after or on a free node IRC. There are always people around to help if you want to try some of these things. And at this point, I really want to start the conversation part of this. Uh, there are a few items on here that I put there, which are, I think, points that we should discuss. Um, like I mentioned, the composer JSON uh, of Drupal is currently located in the subdirectory, um, which means that if you, for example, have a Drupal project and you want to have your own dependencies, um, you, you will have to separately install them or you will have to modify this composer JSON in the core directory, which is really not a great idea. Um, and there's no um, simple way to just add dependencies through the, to this system that already exists, but you're kind of always stuck um, separately installing your own dependencies from the ones that Drupal core itself has, which can actually result in problems if you end up with different versions, which is kind of what Compose is trying to solve by having a single um, way of installing these dependencies for the entire project. Um, we've seen that you can install modules and with their dependencies. However, currently with this um, Dresh tool that I showed, um, these are installed per module. So you have three different modules that all have the same dependency, you actually get this dependency three times, which again can, uh, it's typically not a problem as long as they're in the same version, um, uh, but it's some amount of overhead because you've got the files lying around and the auto loader would be instantiated three times. Uh, it wouldn't actually get loaded multiple times, so it's not, it, it still works, it's just a bit uh, overhead. Um, and then something else, a discussion that actually came up on Drupal.org somewhere at some point is whether or not one should simply use composer JSON files instead of the module info files. And I'll actually point out another one that says you can actually have both, like in this example, and not have too much of a problem. Um, and something that I would like to suggest is that Drupal core itself might actually become a dependency of a Drupal project. So that you um, have a composer JSON on your project level which defines the Drupal core as a single dependency, which is then installed, or uh, if you ship, um, basically what you would ship for a new user um, is a version of this uh, skeleton project, including the already installed uh, Drupal core. But what this allows you to do is have a composer JSON on the root level, where you for your project define all your dependencies that you yourself want to have. At the same time, Drupal core is a separate package with its own composer JSON, where it itself can define all the dependencies it has. And Composer then takes care of making sure that the versions match each other and that you can uh, correctly install dependencies that you have on your level um, as well as where, that are compatible with what Drupal core supports. All right, um, questions, ideas? Anyone want to get started? There's, yeah, there's a microphone in front. Everyone overwhelmed for this? <laughs> I mean, I have more stuff if I should just keep going, but I figure at this point there were probably some questions or... There's, yeah, comments, like really, conversation, yes? So you don't have to ask me something, you can just tell each other something that you think about this if you want to. Uh, Come up right. to the front, just line up for um, the microphone so we can record the sound. So I'm pretty sure the only reason that composer.json was put in the core 
uh, subdirectory was um, out of some kind of fear that if it was in the top level directory, people might think it's something that they can right. mess with. Yep. And uh, but I mean, I don't think that justifies going against the convention. Is there already an issue to move it? Because uh, I don't know what the problem currently is, but that actually does make sense because you, you do get into trouble if people start editing this file. That's why I'm suggesting that you actually have Drupal core as a dependency. Um, because um, if, if you want to update from one Drupal version to another, um, that typically involves uh, changing the version of these dependencies, right? So uh, in, a, in an update of Drupal, um, this file might be modified during the update. So if someone goes and modifies it themselves, you then kind of end up with a situation where there might be some merge conflict between the two and it gets really tricky. Um, so I, I do understand why it was put in the core direct and this actually to a degree makes sense. I mean, people might still go and edit it, but um, I think the clean solution to this is to simply separate the two and have a composer JSON for the Drupal dependencies and consider like the Drupal core a separate package and to have a composer JSON which requires the separate package which is made simply for users to mess with, right? So where they define their own parts. So I think that the, the correct way is to simply split this up into two parts. Um, so I, I see two directions. That, uh, one is you have a module that is only made for Drupal mm -hmm. and it knows about the surrounding and you can make a lot of assumptions that things are there. Yep. And the other thing is that you have a package that only works, that works in Composer and that is meant to work everywhere. It just has to be PHP. And so um, one direction would be that you uh, still make your modules that, um, that it gets a lot easier because you don't have to, um, mm -hmm. to be so yep. general. Or the other thing that would be modules become components and then they have to be, they have to work everywhere. It's like, what now is a Drupal module would turn into a component and then it, you can use it everywhere. So the but there's also a higher cost at making it work everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is that a, a composer project doesn't have to work everywhere or a composer package, right? So you can just have a Drupal module be a composer package which only works within Drupal. Um, so there's actually something, um, I, I think I kind of skipped over this earlier. Uh, well, we looked at the definition here. It's actually type in the second line. Um, so uh, I mentioned these custom installers that automatically install, for example, Drupal modules into the right directory. Um, and you that you would define a composer JSON for a Drupal module that only works within Drupal is by selecting a type like Drupal module. Um, and then these installers actually in install these in a different way. And within such a package, you can just make all these assumptions. So for one thing, these two don't uh, aren't separate, uh, separate. And the other thing is, um, it's extremely useful to separate these, um, to have a module that wraps a generic purpose PHP library, but at the same time, that doesn't mean you always have to do that. I mean, in simple situations, it might just be faster and easier not to do that. Uh, I was just hoping to uh, encourage you to, do that, to think about whether that might make sense, whether there might not be some benefit from doing that. Mm -hmm. So with this type thing, you could actually have some of the rest for free, like it, it would be implicit, like the auto load would always use the Drupal standard auto loading, whatever that is. At um, um, if the auto load you can really to skip know over. Where the folder is and everything. Yeah, you can actually, uh, the, actually, the auto loading might be an exception to that, but I, I, <laughs> in general that should tr sort of work. Um, there's another thing to mention here is that you, you actually have an extra key, uh, which I haven't shown here, uh, which allows you to just define any kind of data that this custom installer might need. So if you want to add some kind of metadata that is only useful to Drupal modules, then you can just add this to this file and it'll be available to this installer. Um, I, I'll have to get back to you whether you can skip the auto load file automatically. Okay, the, the, the other thing would be um, if you separated the module and the um, composer packages, would mm -hmm. you already ship that in the module or would you have to some separate download thing? Would, would um, so basically you can do both. Um, I, you can basically use composer to install this and you can ship a version where this is already installed. Uh, which just allows users to then uh, update this dependency themselves, maybe to replace it or something. Um, but it still doesn't require that users necessarily use Composer to uh, install the dependencies. Um, so I, I would typically recommend that you have some kind of build process where you run Composer install once and then you package this up and ship it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so do you know what Josh make? Sorry? Josh make. I do not know. That's why I'm saying. Like, sure, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> so, um, can we actually go to the last page? Yeah, sure. No I'm not even sure why I'm asking that now, but because uh, you had a nice list of, of, oh, no, I thought the, the very last one, you had this like list of things that we could consider. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. 
Do up to here somewhere. Right, okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, using Composer to install modules, and this notion that you're talking about where we have core as a dependency essentially that's pulled in, that's the same principle that drives Drush make files, which are right. basically manifests right. that, you know, then Drush make runs, it finds everything, it downloads it, it drops it in a place, it applies patches if necessary. Mm -hmm. It So it's same principle. Yep. Um, way less flexible in terms of the actual number of things that you can do, and, and Drush make typically cannot be, like, rerun in order to update dependency. It does, oh. doesn't have a lot concept. So there, there are a number of, of substantive additions in Composer that I would say are... Uh, improvements over 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 Drush make, um, but essentially it's the same concept. So the the community at large is not at all the the notion of of treating core as a dependency is is not at all foreign. And maybe if people were hearing him say that and scratching their heads, like can we really do that? Just think, we do this. Right. We've been doing this for years. This is Drush make. This is this is not right. this is not crazy. Uh, <laughs> it's good that you say that because yeah, yeah, I don't know, right? No, 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 no for sure, for <laughs> sure. And and because I was trying to process it for a second, I'm like, wait, no, this is exactly what we do with Drush yeah. Make. It's the same idea where what you start out with is basically a manifest file of yeah. some kind, and then it just assembles yeah. everything together. I've actually got a, uh, yeah, another slide here. Uh, actually, let's start with this one, uh, which is kind of how you could imagine this working. So you yeah. can use this create project thing to create the basic composer JSON, which just has core as a dependency, which you see down there. And it would generate something like a default directory structure as well as a config mm -hmm. file, which is exactly what you were saying. Yeah, yeah the, the, the place where it is actually maybe a little trickier is the versioning, which we barely talked about at all. But we are nowhere close to semantic versioning yep. in Drupal. I realize. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and there are some actually, I've, I've gone back and forth on this. Pat should get up and make his points about this as well. Um, but we. Given the fact that we include the major version that our software itself, yep. that, that our module is compatible with in its versioning mm -hmm. string, it's not a bad thing. No, the, thing, the thing is that becomes entirely unnecessary with this because you can simply, def, def, you, what you do is you always define Drupal core as a dependency of your individual package. And through that, right. you define exactly for which version you, you're compatible yeah. with. Right. And you're still like free to, for example, if you have your uh, listing of modules on Drupal.org, uh, to just display them the same way. Um, the only, the only necess necessity really is that Composer needs to be able to compare uh, version strings uh, for larger, right. less than, uh, which becomes really tricky with this kind of setup, because there's a lot of logic in having it constructed like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Potentially, there's... we can actually make that work, although I'm not entirely sure how. Yeah, I but was going to ask, like, is the mechanism for doing version compar comparison pluggable? Would we be able to, like, write a Drupal-specific version okay. comparator that just plugs so, in? Um, again, uh, Composer itself is just one big library, uh, yeah. which all uses dependency injection. So, for example, you could just uh, build a, your own wrapper around this, just load all the regular code, and just replace one of these uh, parts Perfect. of it. Uh, or maybe even better, uh, you can just modify Composer to support this if it detects that format of a version string. Right. Because there's right. really no downside to supporting this, uh, like in general, I think, as yeah. long as we can separate them from the other kinds of version numbers. Yeah, yeah, there's, I'm, I'm still, I haven't been able to wrap my head around the idea that, because I get that, that it becomes implicit and the, and the, the, the major yeah. version number could just go away. And maybe it's just that I've been saying like 7.x, 2.x in my head for so many years that I, that I think I can't it might suck be it that, out. yes. It might be, it might be. And, I, and I'm trying it's, to get myself there. But yeah. It's a very important piece of information. Yeah. But uh, as long as you make sure that you always require the Drupal version that you depend on, you at least, um, like functionality wise, you don't lose right. anything. Right. And, and, and that's actually, and, and I'm, I'm clear on the, the like technical side yeah. of it. The, the part that I'm sticking on is whether or not there's some important part of the fact that we I, include I the major version string for people who are choosing right. their modules. Right. So, so I think to some degree, it's really a matter of displaying this kind of information right. in the right places. Yeah. Um, so as long, um, you can basically, I, I, I would imagine that Drupal, if they went to do this, would have something like packages, but integrated Drupal.org, which has the same functionality, and it would just focus more on like which version of Drupal does this module actually work with and yeah. display it in a very similar way to how it does it now. And the other, I think that would cover most of that. Yeah, the other, the other note to just quickly make is that we do, as part of our packaging process, we inject a license file. Uh, so we do have to do slightly more than just say tag it and push it. We actually have to say we're going to roll the release on this because we do inject a license you, file. You do not have the license file in the repository? No, we do not. Um, it's not directly included in the repository. I mean, that that has its own whole long history. But uh, right. it uh, seems like a really strange thing to do because you, you well, do want to work on the license information with the kind like. Well, no, that's the thing. Uh, in order to put get code, in order to push to get on Drupal.org, you have to click something that says anything I put on here is GPL. 
So by right. putting it on there in the first place means it has to be GPL. So yep. if you put your own license file in, then you actually kind of can't do that because by putting the code there in the first place, it was GPL. So what we're doing is when at packaging time, we are enforcing the contract that we set up right. when you agree to get access to version control in the first yep. place. Okay. So, so again, um, I would imagine that Drupal would not necessarily use packages directly. Yeah. Um, so sure, for example, sure. Zen Framework does something very similar where they have a different packaging process and they just run their own repository. Right. Um, and it, it's really not very difficult to set this up where you just package, like you would just continue to have some kind of packaging yeah, yeah. process and all you need to do is in the end generate this kind of metadata that Composer can then use to find these packages. Right. Yeah. And there's, and, and I don't think that's, I, I don't think that's impossible. Although the one piece in here that I, that I've still missed is where does where is the information kept about like what a vendor source actually is? So how does how does Packager figure out that Drupal should be looking at something like for you know Drupal slash core? It looks at vendors yep. Drupal, so it knows that it's looking for something on Drupal.org. Um, so this is really just a string, like it doesn't separate the Drupal and core. Oh, bit. It so doesn't. it's just a Drupal core string, and it just goes through all the repositories that you've loaded and looks for the string, um, and the, it'll return all the packages and all the repositories that you've loaded that. Uh, are named this way, okay. and then it'll match the version uh, constraint that you defined uh, to only get the packages in that version that you wanted to use, and then it'll install that. All right, I should sit down so that he can ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of time. Um, so I agree with you completely about uh, it'd be better to not check the simpling components and three components into core directly. The primary reason that we still can't move to that at this point is that <clears throat> um, since we're chasing dev versions of Symfony right now yep. and of Twig and everything else, um, that means it's quite possible that you know, someone working locally will have a branch of Drupal core that they're working on and another branch of Drupal core they're working on that require different versions yep. of some library. But and that's easy to switch if you remember that command and if you have a network connection at the time. Given how much Drupal code is written on airplanes, that second one might be a challenge. Um, I'm not sure though, but they, I mean, even in that situation with the current one, you still need these different versions of Symfony present, right? So I'm thinking, you know, this branch, we have, you know, Symfony to master th these three libraries from this date, and this branch, we have the same libraries from three months later. Right, yeah. And if I'm working on this branch, right. What on you're an saying airplane, is you don't actually have these installed at the moment, but you want to on, your, on the plane you switch to the other branch and you want to then install these dependencies. Right. The, so those other right. dependencies. Okay. Um, yeah. And that's not an uncommon workflow for Drupal right. core dev. So you know, how would we go about solving that problem so that we could do that? Um, so one thing is that Composer might start solving that somewhat uh, because there's a proposal for having local caching. Uh, so then on the plane, it would like as long as you've at least once checked out this branch before mm -hmm. and downloaded this version, uh, it would have these cached locally. So if you just ran composer install on a different branch, uh, it will realize, oh, these are the versions and see, oh, I've got these locally, so I can just mm -hmm. move them back. Um, so I think that kind of local caching would solve this problem. To a large to, extent. Yeah. Not, like, not completely, but to not, a large extent. Yeah, but. Okay. Do you have any idea how far along that concept is? Uh, there's a request open for it, I think, so that kind of needs reviewing on a few minor changes, but it's okay. basically there. P post a link uh, on the project, or on the um, presentation note on the site after I we will. can try and yep. harass people to, to review that. Yep. Thank okay. you. <laughs> All right, more questions? All right. Uh, in that case, I've got more slides. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, we talked about this. Um, and just to complete that, that, that would basically be the update process for uh, if you wanted to update Drupal. Um, you basically just replace the version of Drupal core that you want to now work with. Um, you can maybe leave the modules that you're using in the same version. And either Composer is going to complain when you try to update and say, well, this isn't actually compatible. And you might have to update one of the modules as well. But it basically takes care of uh, figuring out whether these things are compatible or not. And again, you can wrap this in some kind of Drupal tool uh, so you don't necessarily need to use Composer as is. Actually, another point on that following up on what he yeah. was talking about. Um, one of the side effects of our current versioning approach is that some modules will reset their uh, version between yep. Drupal major versions. Right. So as an example, the organic groups module got up to version yep. like eight something for Drupal 5 mm -hmm. and then dropped back to 1.0 for Drupal 6. Yep which works totally fine in our current model, I suspect here would blow up horribly. Again, it would just be the having the version comparison work on that kind of version numbers, which okay. is not that big a deal. Well, like. what organic groups did was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 
that, that argument could certainly be made. No, but, but there's, there's um, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm uh, there's, there, if you if y'all haven't read it, um, Tom Preston Warner is the one who originally authored the semantic versioning proposal. It makes sense. And when I say that organic groups did it wrong, I mean they did it in a way that wasn't very semantic and didn't make sense. And and really, I have I have yet this the only case that I have seen which doesn't entirely fit the semantic versioning proposal, which is a well thought out proposal and really all of us can pretty much follow. I mean, hell, the kernel's doing it, um, is, uh, uh, is this case where we want to express some like external dependency information with our leading digit, which is not strictly something that we ought to have to do. That information could be recorded somewhere else and, and, and I agree with you on that. It's really just the sort of can we make the shift, can all of our infra shift and can all of the expectations that everyone has around it shift easily enough, which ultimately is a question of how centrally controlled can we make the process of managing that shift so that we don't have people in different weird and consistent version states for some unknown period of time. Uh, but yeah, the, the OG did it wrong. Um, is Moj in here? No, good, uh, sorry. He, he, he agrees that he did it wrong. He didn't realize that that was what the major numbering versions were for. And you, you increment major numbers at certain different types of things. The fact that we reset when we actually change uh, across major version numbers is itself a little bit of an oddity, but we have a, we have an issue inside of the community right now where it's like, so for example, like I can talk about panels two or panels three, and those exist across different Drupal major versions, and we maintained our major version numbering because those actually represent different applications uh, and, and have significantly different functionality. But, so it made sense that we retained the, the, that there was never a, a 7.x, 1.x, or 2.x, whatever branch for, for panels because this is panels three, and that's what that major version number represents. A lot of the time when we do, when there's sort of this resetting of, of major version numbering, I think it's because we're not following a very disciplined uh, uh, numbering schema in the first place. And switching to the system would actually encourage us to be more proactive in thinking about that, which I think would be beneficial. And but highlighting that we would have to make that shift. We would okay. definitely, yeah. And, and that is one of the things that would make the shift difficult, is there's a lot of retraining involved in it how is, people yes. think about it. But, yeah. Someone besides us get up here. <laughs> Anyone? All right. Well, I guess I can show you a few co more cool things you can do with Composer, which is like the thing I've always left, got left over for the end, which is, it goes a bit beyond the simple examples I gave earlier. Um, uh, I kind of touched on this with uh, the example of you have some peer package that has a bug and you want to edit it and it doesn't really work all that well. Um, so in this example, um, where I think you basically, you're working on some kind of Symphony project, and you have a dependency on this monolog bundle for Symphony, which itself has a dependency on the monolog library, right? So you've got this kind of three, your your package, the bundle, and the library itself. So it's like three items, kind of a chain of dependencies, and um, this this library um, has this uh, kind of, it's missing this essential feature for me, um, so. I'm going to fork this library, uh, add this feature that I really want to have, um, and then I want to keep using this. Now, I've got this other package in the middle, right? Because I wasn't originally using the library directly, but I'm using this uh, bundle thing in the middle uh, as a dependency. And this bundle itself says it depends on a particular version of my library, which I just forked and made a new version of. Um, so the um, aliasing in Composer is a way for you to define that some um, branch that you created, in this case it's actually a git branch which is automatically mapped to a version that you can use, def my feature branch. Um, and you can pretend that this is version 1.1.0 um, of the same package, so that the monolog bundle, which depends on 1.1.0, uh, can still correctly install because it thinks its dependency is satisfied uh, because you alias your own new uh, feature branch version as the version it was expecting. Um, so through these aliasing things, this is very really useful if you're working on a project or on multiple parts libraries of a project um, so that you have development versions of various parts uh, and you want to try these out um, while you're working on individual parts. Um, and this allows you to very easily use these branches uh, without having to edit all the dependencies uh, just to try this out. All right. Um, yeah, that's actually kind of a neat, uh, neat feature I didn't really mention before. As I said, um, for example, packages automatically extracts all the version information from tags from uh, something like GitHub or your SVN repository. 
um, and it also automatically creates a dev version for each branch that exists so that you can always uh, specify kind of this uh, running target as a dependency for your project, which is useful in development. Curiosity, how do you... Um, uh, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> this, this, is, this, is, this is me thumbing my nose at other people on Infra. Um, uh, what mechanism do you use for generating those? Because you, you have an actual tarball that can be pulled down, whatever, right? So what, how do you pull the external repository to determine that a change has been made on a branch and that you should repackage the branch tip? Um, so um, the pack, well, basically at the moment we're relying on uh, whichever repository there is to provide us with the package version already. So this works perfectly for using GitHub. I see. Because GitHub see. automatically so provides you, yeah, we're not okay. hosting any code. Um, so if you're using something like an SVN repository at the moment, it'll always install an actual checkout of the SVN repository because there aren't any zip files so for those. Okay. Um, we are planning on adding that to packages. We can talk uh, about that later. It's just one of these things nobody's done yet. No, so. for sure. We can talk about the approach to that later because we've talked about it a lot on yeah. our infra side, and I can tell you what not to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? Anyone? All right. Um, I think in that case, uh, thank you all for listening and participating. Yeah, and I'm still here for the rest of the day and tomorrow. If you wanna, if you think of something that you wanna know about Composer that you wanna talk about, please talk to me. I'm happy to have any conversation whatsoever about this project. <laughs> <laughs>